Hello and welcome to Easter at Two Cities Online. My name is Molly and I'll be your host today. What a crazy time we live in, right? There's nothing easy about being socially distant on a day like today. A day typically filled with family gatherings, sunrise services, and kids hunting eggs with all the neighbors at a local park or with your church family. We've got two ways to make this Easter feel a little more personal. First, we have an online Easter experience for your whole family scheduled to go live at 4 p.m. Pacific Standard Time today. It will premiere right here, wherever you're watching. So make sure you come back for that later today. And second, we've put together a video of some of our kids telling the Easter story in their own words. So in just a minute, we're going to premiere that right here with you right now. So make sure you've invited your friends and family because this is going to be maybe a little less accurate, but certainly entertaining. Easter story. The story of Jesus. The story of Easter is, uh, I don't know. Because we are thankful. Point. We're going to tell you the story of Easter is about having fun and finding eggs and to eat them. Because everywhere in Southern California, everywhere. Easter is finding eggs and eating the kids. Even in Hawaii. Kids have to find eggs and eat the candy that's inside the eggs. Until everybody celebrates Jesus. God came. A lot of people loved God, but some didn't. He was going to Jerusalem. Jesus is coming in on a donkey. And people would cut down palm tre trees and put the leaves on the ground mm -hmm. so that he won't get dirty. No, they did a wing, wing, yeah, they wing. swing it around. We came out to meet him crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. The Lord. He he put, picked um four of the scribbles and he they are like his best friends and all the homies. <laughs> and one night he told them that one of them was going to betray him and he would soak their feet to tell them how he loved them and then he also he told them that soon he would die. One of the disciples snuck out and went to the religious leaders who thought that Jesus was not the real son of God and that he was faking it. How did he die? Then they, they were gonna kill him. Oh no, who was gonna do that? Uh, the pilot. They took Jesus to jail and put a, a thorn crown on him to make fun of him. People did not like Jesus. So they put him on the cross. That's not very nice. A man helped him carry the cross to the mountain. The pilot put Jesus on the cross with nails on his hands, and his hands were like this, and on his, with his feet. Then he made him carry a cross, and they nailed nailed him to the cross. And then did he die? A little. He was way high. I have a question. Yes. A man said, you save everyone, and, and then he told Jesus, why can't you save yourself? It's not a question, that's an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and they crucified him on the cross, and everyone came and was really sad. Jesus' friends took him and buried him in a in white cloths and laid him in a tomb. They, he sacrificed himself. They put him in a tomb, a little den thingy. God sacrificed him to let us live so his people can have eternal life. They put him in there and then they put a big boulder in front of him. Some three night came and they pushed a big boulder around the thing. Three days later, an angel came and said he is alive. This girl named Mary came to check on him. An angel said, God is alive. He, he has risen from the dead. He said, what did he do to Jesus? And then he ran to Jesus and the scribbles that they were locked in a room. And then he told Jesus was alive. They came and the tomb was open. Oh, the tomb was empty. Mary came back to the city, city and, and told everybody, God has risen from the dead. 
go tell everyone the good news that Jesus is alive, he has risen from the dead. And also he was in the room and he, he visited very often before he went to heaven that <laughs> I know one part of Easter story. Jesus read from the dead. Jesus read from the dead? Jesus rose from the dead. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And that's the story of Easter. Because Jesus is alive. And then they're all happy. That's the story. Jesus loves everybody. That's the Easter story. Happy Easter! Happy Easter! Hi, my name is Micah, and I'm the lead pastor of Two Cities Church and Two Cities Online. I want to let you know that our mission here is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ through every single thing that we do. Now, today is a little bit different from your traditional Easter, and I realize that you may be spending time with us today that you would normally be spending with friends and family and brunches and celebrations and Easter egg hunts and all those sorts of things, but we are happy to create this environment for you today to focus on what this day is all about. Now we want this to be an interactive experience and so we'd love for you to talk amongst yourselves in the chat and also right now, I'd love to know where you're watching from. Are you watching from California? If so, what city? Are you watching from Maryland? Hello, Maryland friends. Are you watching from Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Texas, Wyoming, or Montana? I don't know where you're at today, but if you would, please let us know in the chat right now where you're watching from so that we can celebrate with you and know you a little bit better. As I've already mentioned, today is a very special day. Easter is the day we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. And you know what? Without the resurrection, nothing else would matter. But because of the resurrection, everything matters. Well, I hope you've grabbed your coffee, a Bible, a notebook even, because today you might want to take some notes. Today's going to be special. But before we get into the message and before we get into some worship music, I love for you to participate with me and watch this video to set up our hearts, to get us prepared for a time of worship together. Here we go. The idea of one seems so small, so insignificant. But history has shown us that it all begins with one. One idea, one dream, one movement can ignite change. One idea in a garage designed the future. One decision to speak up gave a generation a reason to stand up. One small step 
inspired exploration. That's one small step for man. One decision to stay seated changed the nation. One invasion started a revolution. One invention illuminated possibilities. One proclamation defined freedom. One document forged a country. One writer moved millions. One nail reformed a religion. But before all of that, one event changed everything. One innocent man was condemned. One perfect person was accused. One king was mocked. One back carried a cross. One side was pierced. One final breath was breathed. One life was sacrificed. But one grave could not hold him down. One stone could not keep him in. And on the third day, one man rose from the grave conquering sin and death forever. And it is under that name that we are redeemed, brought to life, forever made free. Under this one name, the beautiful, wonderful, powerful name of Jesus.
my name is Liz. Thanks for worshiping with us today. There's no greater joy than knowing our hope is in Jesus and not our circumstances. One of our goals in providing these online services is to provide community for people like you. We want you to engage beyond observation and half attention. We want you to sing aloud, to converse with your virtual neighbor, and to apply what you learn to your daily life. But sometimes it's hard to figure out that application part, and it's hard to be in a community when you can't be face to face. In order to help, we'd like to invite you to engage in a virtual community group. That's a small group that meets through Zoom on a weekly basis. We've got a couple of them up and running, and we'd like to offer that same thing to you. So if that sounds like something that would help right now, just fill out the virtual connection card and let us know. The link is in the chat. Another way you can get involved is to give. And right now, we want to give you the opportunity to be a financial partner with Two Cities. All you have to do is text any amount to the number on the screen. And for those of you who give regularly, you have no idea how thankful we are for your continued generosity. Without your partnership, we wouldn't be able to provide hope and help to those in need and be the community that we are. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. And now here's Micah for today's message. I love Easter. At Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection points to the answer of a question everyone should ask. Who is Jesus? The resurrection convinced his first century followers that he was the Son of God and has been convincing people ever since. You should know that we don't believe Jesus rose from the dead just because the Bible tells us so. What we believe is so much better than that. We believe this because Matthew, Mark, Luke, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and Paul documented it in the first century. They recorded what they saw and heard in the time of Jesus. They collected and protected their accounts, which were later put into the volume that we know as the Bible. Listen, the story of Jesus wasn't worth telling apart from the resurrection, and it's still not. And the people closest to the action were very honest with their accounts. They didn't write themselves in as heroes, but as failures. And they expected Jesus to do exactly what dead people always do. Stay dead. I need you to lean in and hear me on this. Nobody expected no body. John was a witness of the crucifixion and the resurrection. And he wrote a very detailed account of each. Like others at the time, he didn't expect either the crucifixion or the resurrection to take place. He expected a king. See, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, there was a great momentum and an increase of the people putting their faith in Jesus. And many believed in him. In fact, too many believed for the comfort of others. Because of that, Jesus' enemies plotted to arrest him while he was in Jerusalem for the Passover. Spies and expectant fans filled the streets of Jerusalem, and Jesus arrives to crowds chanting his name and declaring him as king. A few days later, Jesus celebrates the Passover meal with his 12 apostles. He announces the inauguration of a new covenant that is a new arrangement or agreement between man and God, and a new command to go along with this new covenant. It was to be the brand or the trademark of his new movement. The apostles thought Jesus was about to declare himself king, and then he's betrayed. And Jesus is arrested and taken to the high priest, where he's falsely accused, and he's beaten, and later taken to Pilate. And after talking to Jesus and finding no reason to charge him, Pilate decides to have him flogged. He thinks the crowd will change their mind about wanting to have Jesus executed. 
And after the flogging, the people still insist that Pilate must have Jesus executed, crucified. John was there, and he saw all this, and he wrote about it. He wrote about it in the Gospel of John. I'm going to read some of those verses to you today from the Gospel. John 19, verse 16. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. John records Jesus' words from the cross. While standing next to Jesus' mother Mary, witnessing this horrific scene, he hears Jesus tell him that Mary is now John's mother, and he is now her son. He was telling John to take care of his mom. John then heard Jesus utter his last words, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Then John pauses and reflects and makes a very unusual statement. He made it for future generations, for us, for you, and for me. And here it is. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that. So that. See, John at this point in his writing reaches out through the ages, puts his hand on our shoulders, looks at us in the eyes, and says so that you may believe. Maybe you object to that charge to believe, and you think something like this. Well, John, so far, so good. Rome crucified another wannabe king. We believe you. And maybe John would respond like this. No, not that part. It's what happened next that you'll have a hard time believing. Verse 38. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. So we don't know what Jesus and Peter did that night on Saturday. John tells us that early Sunday, though, they were awakened by the sound of banging at their door. It was Mary Magdalene. She was panicked and sobbing. She says to Peter and John, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. See, a missing body usually meant grave robbers. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Why didn't John go into the tomb? Well, maybe because it was dark. And it's a tomb. And he records this with such honesty. He's not portraying himself to be some sort of a hero, which is what someone would do if they were fabricating a story like this. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He didn't even stop. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. See, thieves wouldn't have taken the time to unwrap the body. Verse 8, finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and he believed. And in an instant, his world changed. The resurrection reframed everything about his life. It reframed all his understanding about Jesus. And suddenly everything that Jesus had ever said suddenly came into light and he knew it was absolutely true. John and others saw Jesus alive several times. John records many of those conversations that they had with him after the resurrection. I want to read one of those particularly important moments. Verse 24, chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And who could blame him? A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out to your hand and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. Thomas said to him, My Lord 
And my God, Thomas realized the truth of who Jesus was in this moment. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. And are you ready for this? See, Jesus looks beyond the context of his immediate time frame. Knowing this story would be repeated for generations, with you in mind, he smiles and he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. In other words, blessed are you who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who have believed based on the testimony of men like John. He closes his account with an invitation. It's a simple invitation to believe and to trust. Verse 30. Jesus performed many, many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not recorded in this book. And when he says in this book, he means the Gospel of John. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Why do you think John would write that account? Well, I think John would say what happened that morning sealed punctuated and authenticated the promise of Jesus and the promise of God. When Jesus rose from the dead, he gave us all access to that same miraculous fate. Access that can only be granted through faith in Jesus, which gives us right standing with the Father through his sacrifice, through his grace. Today, if you need that promise in your life, if you need right standing with God, all you need to do is place your faith in Jesus. Trust Him with your life. Surrender, and His grace will be upon you. So I want to give you that opportunity today, this Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, a historical account. I want to give you the opportunity to place your faith in Jesus based on the eyewitness accounts of all these people. All you got to do is place your faith in Jesus. Surrender to Him. Trust Him with your life. And here's a simple way to do that. I'm going to pray a prayer, and I want to invite you to pray it with me. And if you pray this prayer, I want you to write in the chat, I believe. I want you to fill out a virtual connection card so that we have a record of that. But right now, just pray this prayer with me. Father, thank you so much. So much that you love me no matter what. You know every mistake I've ever made and will make. You know every sin that resides in my heart. You know every desire that is not from you. And yet, you look at me and you don't see those things. You see your son. I claim that as truth today for myself. That when you see me, you see the perfection of your son, not the imperfection of my sin. Father, I, I place my faith in Jesus. I trust that he rose from the dead. God, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Lord, help me place my life in your hands. I surrender to you. I'm tired of running, and I'm tired of trying to do this on my own, God. I am yours. In Jesus' name, amen.